The best thing I can say about him is he's really a good AA. And he's helped a lot of people. And I've been a part of a lot of people's sobriety up here in his sharing. And uh, he's got a good program. And I, I'm going to let his sponsor come up and say a word or two about him, too. Come on, B.C. Uh, I'm B.C. Miller, my partner, I'm a drug addict. And uh, because this program works, I haven't found necessary to take a drink or do any drugs since uh, May of 1984. For that, I'm truly grateful. And uh, I'm sure Stevie's got plenty to say. Anything that uh, I would say would probably be... Uh, you want me to be self-serving, so I'm going to let Stevie go right now. Hello, everybody. I'm Stevie. I'm an alcoholic, an addict, and I, too, am nervous. I've been sober today by the grace of God, and that's the only way I know of. Um, everything I've done got me here I know that um, a lot of a lot of what got me here was also the grace of God because I couldn't have uh, couldn't have needed the questions or had the questions I don't think that uh, that I try to find out the answers to these days without the grace of God I started off my drinking and using career, oh, I guess early 60s, when I was somewhere around uh, seven or eight years old. I grew up in an alcoholic family. My father was an alcoholic, and even though I saw the problems that alcohol caused in our family, I still found it attractive for some reason. I don't know what that was. I thought I was missing something. I was always a kid who was afraid I was going to miss something. Somewhere along the line, I started trying to uh, find out why my father would go back and, and continue to drink, even though every time he did, I saw what happened, which was big fights, you know, violence. Um, and we were always real scared of him. But he continued to do it anyway, and I never, I never did understand what that was until one day, a few years later, I realized that I wasn't doing anything any differently other than making a little bit more money and it added a few drugs to it, you know. Um, I guess about seven or eight years old, I started stealing drinks. Either, uh, well, my parents used to have these, these 42 parties, and quite a few people would come over, and they'd be uh, having their Tom Collins or whatever, you know. And when somebody wasn't looking, I'd take one of the drinks and run in the kitchen, you know, and make them a new one. And uh, <laughs> refresh their drink, you know. It's just that I would refresh my memory about what it tasted like a lot of the time. You know? I never really, I never really thought that it tasted very good or anything. And then, when, then one day I tried to, I tried to uh, make myself a drink out of my dad's bourbon that was in the freezer. It didn't taste very good either. I guess it was the wrong brand or something. Like that. But somewhere along the line, I started finding that attractive somehow. About the same time, my father, a ear, nose, and throat doctor, who it was general practice with him when when you went in for him to take a look up your nose, he would squirt you full of what I later found out was a strong solution of liquid cocaine. And I never really knew why my face was numb when I left there, and why I felt a little different. But I later on found out that I didn't know how to breathe without the stuff. You know? because it was in a nose spray he gave me. The first bottle said use, you know, once every 24 hours. The second bottle said use two or three sprays every 12 hours, and the next one said use as needed. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> a 
But I guess as I was going into junior high was when I started, when I really started trying to drink. We'd moved to Graham, Texas, and I really didn't want to go at all. Um, I'd, I'd gotten in the first band that I really wanted to be in and was excited about it. And we had to move, and I had to give up everything, you know, including my way. We got to Graham, and uh, my parents had told me we were going to be there for about six weeks. And that was about six weeks into the six months that we stayed there. While I was going to school there, actually the first day I went to school there in Graham, Texas, just to show you what kind of, how much I liked it. I got kicked out of school three times the first day. <laughs> and uh, I didn't even do anything. You know, I just went to school and they didn't like how my belt was, or they didn't like how my hair was cut twice. You know. And uh, I real quick found this guy that sold, he sold Alka-Seltzer bottles full of, full of sour mash. And, uh, continue to find him every day, you know. Even though I, did, I didn't like how it tasted or anything, it just kind of helped me smooth along, you know. Because there wasn't anything that I really wanted there. I'd get beat up all the time. And, and there wasn't anybody to play any music with. And we stayed there for about six months, and finally I just told my parents that I wasn't going back to school anymore. And that ended up being about the same time we moved back to Dallas. And back to Dallas for me was, I didn't realize what I was doing at the time, but really all I, all I really was doing here at the time was, uh, well, I was trying to play music and everything, but, but the main thing I was doing was hanging out with the kids down the street. And uh, what they did all the time was see how they could get high this way or that way, you know. And I thought that, well, all I was doing was just trying to be in with the people, you know, with these kids. What I was really doing was learning how to get high and stay high all the time and run away from what was going on, which was, um, I guess what was going on really was that, uh, you know, people grow up and they learn things about living life and, uh, and grow. I didn't, uh, I never, that never dawned on me. I just thought you just kind of went from day to day and you got older and then things happened and you graduate and, or quit school or whatever. At any rate, I learned, uh, I just learned how to bag glue and how to, how to figure out this pill was this kind and this was that kind and if you hit real hard on this joint you might get a buzz. Usually I was scared to though at the time. <laughs> the thing was is that was the only thing I knew how to do. The only thing I knew how to do was just try to try to get by every day. I wasn't really learning anything about living life. There was really no information at home because I, I couldn't. It was pretty violent in my house. I couldn't go and, and ask my dad about things. Um, I couldn't go ask my dad about about school or about girls or about anything because it was uh it's pretty much you're supposed to know that stuff on your own <coughs> or just leave me alone is that your stuff get it out of the room you know so i uh i just continued to try to find out things from the kids down the street and that wasn't the way to really go i didn't know that What I did keep learning though was about was about bands and what not to blame not to blame my drinking or anything on bands but I sure learned a lot about it there because <laughs> that was and still is unfortunately a lot of in a lot of places that's where a lot of the myth about it's real neat to get high or real cool to get high that's where I learned a lot of it because a lot of the people I really looked up to really knew how to drink and really knew how to get high. And uh, along with every time I would get in a better band, it seemed like there were better drugs. <laughs> and uh, 
better brand of a gin or whatever, you know. And I always thought I had to keep up. I just thought I had to keep up. Why that was, I don't know. I would see, uh, I would see someone who I really cared about and know that they, this, this is a pattern that's gone on most of my life and I still don't understand why it's attractive to me or has been. I would see someone who I really cared and loved, you know, cared for and loved and that they couldn't do anything unless they were shooting something and I would see that it would be literally killing them and that would be a good reason for me to try it. I don't know. I don't understand that. That's what that's a pattern that I developed. I saw it with my father, I saw it with very close friends and I've seen it with people who are no longer alive, you know. I'm glad to say that I'm not doing that anymore. Because there was a stage in my life where I got to uh, experiment and not like I thought experimenting was in the first place, but what happens to you if you do this much, you know? There was a time in my life when uh, a normal day would be to pull out whatever I could get my hands on and do it all at once. It wasn't do it till it was gone, it was do it all right then. And it would be enough to kill somebody. But for some reason, that was what I did. And I would sit there and go, well, this is what happens, and, and stay alive somehow. And I got it in my head that that was a, I don't know, somewhere along the line I got this verse, or it's not even a verse, it's just something in the Bible where uh, in the last days people will be trying to kill themselves and can't. And that's what I thought I was doing, I think. For some reason I thought I couldn't die. I guess that's that Superman deal that we get. Through the years, all this progressed and I just got to where uh, everything I was doing was on a road to killing me. The only thing that I was doing that wasn't destructive was trying to play music. But that was really quickly everything else. I still cared about someday finding something that meant something to me inside and with another person or with other people. I still cared about growing somehow. But bit by bit all of that was going somewhere in the past where uh, I couldn't reach it anymore. It was like a, it was like a, something that I couldn't reach anymore, something that I just could dream about. And the things that I was doing every day was more like a trudge just to keep, keep going because I didn't know how to stop anything I was doing or the predicaments I was in. And then one day about close to three and a half years ago, I started realizing that I could not live on the way I was going, but I could not stop either. I didn't know how to stop, and I knew that I couldn't keep going. And that was a real strange place to be for me because I literally could not imagine the next day without a big bag of dope and several bottles of, of whiskey. I thought that, uh, literally what I thought was that I would go on doing that until I died and then it would be a lot better because I wouldn't have to deal with it anymore. In my mind that seemed like a real good solution because I wouldn't have to deal with it anymore but the people that I was mad at would you know. I don't know why that seemed so neat to me 
uh, I don't know why I was that mad at people. You know? I guess I was probably mad at myself. That's really what it was. Because to be honest, at the time, I thought those people were really uh, trying to get revenge on me or whatever. And that's why they did the things that they were doing. And really, the truth of the matter was that I was just trying to get revenge on people that I couldn't understand. You know? But instead of, instead of doing it till I died, what happened was... Uh, I collapsed and just gave up. It was it was funny because I saw it coming for a while. And the reason that I wouldn't let go and give up that fight in the first place was because of what other people would think. You know what they would think. Not that uh, they would find out that I was getting loaded, or not that they would find out how bad off I I'd, I'd gotten. But w that they would think that I was weak because I gave up. And uh, it took a lot to find out that that was the stronger thing to do, was to say, I can't do this anymore. You know, I have to live instead of die. So I woke up. I said I woke up, I got up and went to a friend of mine's hotel room and uh, sat there shaking and said, you know, this is what's going on. And uh, they called me an ambulance. And we were in Germany at the time. We went to, went to this hospital and uh, somehow, somehow I got the nerve to get out of that hospital r real quick because... Uh, I thought it was kind of strange. They kept asking me questions and then ignored me when I answered them. Yeah. And uh, then, it, then it dawned on me that they were speaking German. <laughs> and <laughs> no wonder they weren't listening, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I did get out of there. And went to a, it was a couple of days later, but I ended up going to a hospital, or going to see a doctor in London. And he, he was someone that I'd heard of, that I knew that, that, could, do some, that do, could do some good and give me some help. And he put me in a hospital for a few days and, and uh, just kind of looked out after me for a little bit while he basically detoxed me. I said basically detox because the guy didn't have that that conventional of an idea of, of detox. It was uh, if I needed if I really needed a drink, I could have one. If I really thought I really needed a drink, he thought I should have one within about a five day period. Because he just, the way he looked at it and the way he told me was if you've been drinking for twenty five years you're not gonna stop in a minute, you know. Instead of giving me uh, phenobarbital or whatever it is they usually give you, he gave me, so he just said, you can go have a drink if you really need one over the next five days. And in fact, he gave me, he gave me a drink on my birthday, which I was in the hospital. A little bitty cup of champagne. What really happened after that was I got out of the hospital and we flew back to the States to go to treatment and I tried to get drunk on the plane. It didn't work. It didn't work. And what I'd done was I went, this was pretty funny to me, I went to my mother. She'd come over to see me in the hospital. I called her up and said, I called her and my girlfriend and said, look, I'm in the hospital. This is what's going on. They both were there the next day. And I'm real grateful for that. It means a lot to me. They, uh, we were on our way back over to the States, and I was sitting there next to my mother, and I didn't have any money, so I borrowed $20 to go buy some cigarettes on the plane. And uh, she knew there was no machine, you know? <laughs> 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 I 
I went and tried to find out how many Crown Royals I could get, you know. And uh, there's never enough. Uh, I learned that a long time ago. There's never enough dope and there's never enough to drink. There's either too much or not enough. You know, there's never just enough. But I, uh, I went and tried anyway. And went back and I felt, I don't know, I felt guilty already. I'm real good at the guilt. You know, I went straight back to the seat and sat down next to her. You know, and looked, this is not what I did, you know, and she went, I kind of knew that, you know. And, uh, at any rate, we went back, we got, we got, we landed and, and, uh, I went to a hotel room, stayed there until the next day, went into treatment. I didn't expect to find out in treatment that that was one of the coolest places I'd ever been. But that's what I found out, you know. It wasn't, uh, what I thought it was going to be at all. I went through the regular stuff, you know, what if they find out I'm in here, or who's they, and, you know, <laughs> and, and I don't want to be here, and all, you know, all that stuff, but once I, once I got, once I started paying attention to what was going on in treatment, to recovery, it's been something that I've really wanted ever since. not always been real good at sticking to a good strong program but at least i know that when i'm able to find those steps in my life that it works this is the end of side one please turn your cassette over and continue to play on the other side thank you <laughs>